Hi, and welcome, everybody. My name is Julie Weed. I'm a Cornell grad and contributing writer to The New York Times. I'm also the proud president of the Cornell Club of Western Washington, our alumni club here in Seattle. I'm excited to take, today to take you behind the scenes with some of our cutting edge Cornell researchers to learn how artificial intelligence and psychology research is changing the driving experience. Let me introduce our guest today to hear about this and more. Sylvia Ferrari is the John Brancaccia Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell. She is the Director of the Laboratory for Intelligence Systems and Control and the Co-Director of the Vejo Institute on Vehicle Intelligence. Sylvia's work includes how autonomous systems can sense the environment around them and react to it without human intervention. Welcome, Sylvia. Wendy Ju is an Associate Professor in the Jacobs Technion Cornell Institute at Cornell Tech. She researches how people interact with autonomous systems, including cars and robots. Her PhD is in mechanical engineering from Stanford University with a master's degree for the MIT Media Lab. Welcome. Karen Levy is an assistant professor with Cornell's Ann S. Bowers College of Computing and Information Science and associate faculty at the Cornell Law School. She holds a PhD in sociology from Princeton University and a law degree from Indiana, Indiana University. Dr. Levy has also served as a law clerk in the United States federal courts. She researches the interaction of law, technology, and surveillance and how it affects our behavior. Thank you all for being here today. Let's start with our behind the scenes conversation with a look into our panelists research areas. Karen, perhaps you can start with the life of a modern truck driver. Sure, thanks for having me today, Julie. I'm really pleased to be able to join all of you on the panel. Um, so for almost a decade now in my research, I've been studying trucking and truckers and how new technologies have been introduced into the long haul trucking industry and what effects they have on workers there. Um, and 10 years ago, when I started doing this research, a lot of the technologies I was focused on were about collecting data about how truckers were driving and where they were, um, which introduced a lot of big changes into an industry that has traditionally been very much grounded in independence of work. Um, which is pretty unusual actually for the sort of blue collar work that trucking is. Um, but in the last five years or so, when I tell people I'm working on trucking and technology, people say like, oh yeah, autonomous trucks. And for a while I would correct them and I would say, no, not autonomous trucks, these other technologies that are collecting data about truckers. But over time, you know, I started to integrate thinking about autonomous vehicles into my work and trying to find the connections between autonomous, the development of autonomous trucks and these other technologies that I've been looking at that supervise drivers. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, right, the reason people would ask about autonomous trucks is because there's a good deal of sometimes quite breathless headlines about what jobs are going to disappear. And a lot of that, that discussion has been focused on long haul truck drivers. Um, some early estimates um, among economists suggested that trucking could be one of the most automatable jobs. Uh, in 2016, the White House issued a report on AI automation in the economy, which forecast that 80 to 100% of heavy and tractor trailer truck driving jobs, so up to 1.7 million people, um, would be substantially threatened by autonomous vehicle technologies. And if we go to the next slide, we can sort of see why this is such a concern. This is a, a graphic using Bureau of Labor Statistics data from 2014. Um, and I don't know how well you can see it on the slide, but each of the aqua states, the most, the, the kind of dominant color on the, on the map, um, those are states in which the most common job is truck driver. So it's the most common job in 29 states, according to this data. Um, so you could imagine, right, why disruption in an industry of this size would be potentially really catastrophic across a wide swath of the country. And it may be that it's an industry that's ripe for disruption. So in a lot of my research, I um, explore how, you know, trucking is really hard and unsafe work. Truckers suffer just really incredible levels of fatigue. Some people compare trucking work to sweatshop labor in terms of the amount that truckers drive and the pay that they receive for their work. Uh, it has the eighth highest rate of occupational fatalities in the country. And there's been a lot of technical progress, right, that would make autonomous vehicles um, seem quite promising in this industry. Um, the reality, however, as I've started to kind of consider, again, the relationship between the technologies I've been looking at um, previously and autonomous vehicles, the reality is more complicated. Um, so unemployment is certainly a really real threat that truckers face. But robot trucks, like autonomous trucks, are unlikely to sort of decimate the profession in this sudden phase transition that people sometimes like to write headlines about, right? The path to full autonomy in trucking is not likely to be a cliff, right, where we're like human, 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 and then robot. It's instead going to be a much more gradual slope, right? And this is often actually how we see new technologies be integrated into industries. 
And there's lots of reasons for, for why it'll be that slope, right? If there'll be, there are social factors and legal factors and cultural factors, some things that I know my co-panelists will talk about, um, things that don't always get considered in economic forecasts or in technical forecasts. And one big piece of it is that truckers work involves a lot more than driving a truck, right? They have a lot of other um, duties that they have to fulfill. They have to monitor their freight. They have to secure their loads. They have to do safety inspections. They have to, you know, interface with customers. They have to do maintenance and repair, like all kinds of things that might eventually be automated, but are not immediately going to be automated, even in the best, even, even if we could fully automate driving, there's lots of other aspects of the job that are unlikely to be automated soon. So what this means is that instead of thinking about this sudden wave of unemployment and being really scared about that, we, we should think about that concern, but we should also think about how AI will change what trucking work looks like over the long haul. Um, there will still, that's a joke, long haul. there will still be truckers, but what it will mean to be a trucker will change, right? And it's already changing. So that's what I actually want to spend the rest of my time talking with you about today, is what AI actually looks like in trucking today. So if we go to the next slide, you can see kind of how this is represented in the industry. This is a cartoon that was um, that appeared in 2017 in a trucker's trade magazine that I read. Um, and the article that accompanies the illustration laments the rise of the robo trucker. So the driver, as you can see here, right, this cartoon driver is burdened by this proliferation of gadgets that are largely about kind of monitoring his body and keeping him awake and alert. Um, and the technologies that are shown in this, it's a cartoon, right? So the, the technologies are exaggerated a little bit, but they're actually just a little bit exaggerated. Like they're not so different from a lot of products that are on the market now that do more or less what this cartoon depicts. Um, these are tools that are generally marketed as fatigue detection systems or sometimes lone worker, mo worker monitoring devices. And their goal is by and large to give managers remote insight into how tired a trucker's body is and how fit he is to drive at any given moment. So I'll show you just a couple of these technologies, although there's several I could show you if you wanna to go to the next slide. So um, this is an advertisement by a company, it's an Australian company called Seeing Machines. They market um, eye tracking cameras that monitor the flutter of a driver's eyelids as he's driving and then sends that data to the back office. Um, there's several companies kind of working in this space. My favorite is a system that integrates the driver facing camera with a vibrating seat cushion. So it kind of just gooses the driver back into alertness when he starts to get tired. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see the smart cap. Um, this is a baseball cap or a beanie that detects fatigue by monitoring a driver's brain waves. It essentially does just a constant EEG and it transmits that fatigue data back in, in, in real time back to a manager or back to a family member in some cases. Um, there are similar case, similar technologies that will sound alarms or flash lights in the driver's eyes, um, that vests that detect heart rates, headsets that monitor like mirror checks, all kinds of different wearables and camera systems that go in the tr in the cab with the trucker. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I just you know what I, what I want to hit home is that you know the felt reality of AI and trucking labor now is not this displacement, right? It's it's using AI instead to address perceived human weakness via this really constant and actually quite intimate monitoring. So there's a big distance, right, between these the narratives that are on the slide here, right, this narrative of displacement and then how this um, the threat of AI is actually felt, right? So the displacement threat is real. We should think about it. We should prepare for it. But it's not yet borne out by the common experience of low-wage workers in the industry. Instead, the way they feel AI is as this intrusion, right, this sort of hybridization between themselves and the machine. So AI in trucking today isn't kicking you out of the cab, right? It's like texting your boss and it's flashing lights in your eyes and it's goosing your backside. So all of this, I think, suggests that we need to be quite broad in our thinking about how, what automation does to work, right? That it doesn't just replace work, but it can also like really um, quite seriously affect the quality and dignity of work. And that's something that I think in CIS, we try to pay a lot of due attention to is, is both of these things, right? Holding both of these things in our heads at the same time and making sure that they're both getting their due as we develop new technologies. Wow. It's so interesting <laughs> because the life of a truck driver, you think as like life on the road, independence, be yeah. around boss, go when you want, when you want, just get the thing there on time. It's yep. absolutely not like that at all, is it? It's changed a lot. It has changed a lot. Wow. Um, Next is Sylvia. We'll he'll hear a bit about Sylvia's research. Um, as Karen said, the news is always a lot about self-driving cars, but what you're working on are artificial drivers. 
and emotion monitors for drivers, which is just the whole other end of the spectrum. I'd love to hear more about that. Thank you, Julie. Yes, um, in the last few years, we've been working with uh, Ferrari GT uh, on advanced driver assistance systems for high performance automotives that will always have a driver in the seat. <laughs> so the company has been developing sensors. Um, there were primarily remote sensors, for example, a uh, sensor built in the steering wheel or the seat, or even simply the dashboard, like the camera that you see on this slide. Um, and these sensors um, were supposed to monitor the state of the driver uh, so as to interact with the onboard automatic control systems. So Ferrari has also developed uh, onboard control systems that can adjust the response of the automobile to the driver. And these have also been used on board uh, fly-by-wire aircraft to change the way the aircraft responds to the pilot. And so with that inspiration, that was also, in fact, part of my PhD research. Uh, Ferrari GT developed some automatic control systems that can adapt the response of the automobile so that the dynamics um, in the closed loop will change depending on uh, the driver's emotional state. So currently, the automobile has a manual manettino that allows the driver to choose that setting mm -hmm. and make the car peppier or sta more stable and safer to drive. But in our project, we worked with Amedeo Visconti at Ferrari and also Guillermo at Duke. You see the team uh, shown on this slide uh, was involving people with their different backgrounds, including um, some medical doctors and psychologists. And in this project, we developed some algorithms for inferring the emotional state of the driver from the feedback that the sensors provided. So for example, in the video here, you see um, an algorithm that tracked facial features to detect the emotions of the driver from the live camera recording on the dashboard. And so as the car, um, for example, may become more stable and easier to drive in response to a driver uh, who is distracted or angry and therefore does not really have the attention to change the monotone setting. Uh, at the same time, the car may become sportier and more aggressive when the driver is focused, happy, and engaged in the driving of the car. Um, so these are some examples of the work we did together, but they also developed other sensors for recording biometrics uh, that can confirm both the emotions and the health of the driver. So for example, if the health should become at risk as sometimes happens with diabetic patients or the focus of attention decreases, um, the car can actually uh, possibly change into a more automated mode and actually take over from the driver. Then on the next slide, you'll see another project that we had with um, uh, the car company, Ferrari GT. Uh, and th this project, we actually developed an artificial neural network model of the driver. And these were professional drivers that the engineers at Ferrari um, essentially employ to drive the car and test the latest automatic control system systems and their latest developments, including the algorithms I mentioned before. And these drivers are highly skilled and also uh, expensive. So um, we were essentially recruited by Ferrari to develop a model of the driver, of each individual driver with different expertise and different skill level. Uh, and we use data collected during the, uh, during the laps at the Fiorano track and also in the hills near Maranello to train these artificial neural networks. Uh, you'll see here on the slides, actually in the blue line, you'll see the data that we used for training. And then the artificial neural networks actually were able to replicate the driving style of each of their professional driver. And therefore, based on what the car is doing and based on the road conditions, uh, replicate the type of decisions that that human driver would make uh, under the same circumstances, including you know when to uh, change the gear shift, when to brake, and how to accelerate depending on the, on the road conditions, which includes some very steep turns. Um, so these are some of the projects we worked on together. Together. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing to think of a neural network becoming a race car driver. Yeah, so this was useful to the engineers because they were able to use the neural network in place of the driver. <laughs> For example, when working late at night <laughs> and plugging the neural network into the simulator <laughs> when they wanted to have a driver <laughs> and the driver maybe was off. <laughs> 
Yeah, so now that you have like this, just like driver in a box at any time you need a driver for any kind of road conditions, you have this Ferrari race car driver just just ready for your computer system. Exactly. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, Wendy, maybe you could take us behind the scenes to the research you've been doing on how people behave towards autonomous vehicles and how we as people expect them to behave towards us. Thanks, Julie. It's uh, really exciting to share a stage with Karen and Sylvia. Um, so this uh, opening slide here actually shows my driving simulator, which we haven't been able to really get in for a few months now. Um, but we normally, when we're looking at um, how people interact with automation, very often we're simulating future scenarios and then looking to see how people behave in them and using that information to decide how we might want to design um, autonomous vehicles, road alerts, different things. Um, but what I'm going to talk about right now is like how we're, we're thinking about cross-cultural differences. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, a lot of times when we think about cross-cultural differences, we think about things like internationalization or like on the next slide, this is a Chevy Nova. Um, and in the automotive industry, this is like this apocryphal story about how because the um, people who named it didn't do their research, the Chevy Nova didn't sell in Latin America because Nova means don't go. It's a great story, except that this car sold super well in Latin America. Um, but when we go um, to autonomous vehicles, like on the next slide, we see things like this where um, we, when we think about internationalization, I'm really provoked by quotes like this. This is um, something that was said by the person who's in charge of Uber ATC in Pittsburgh. Um, and he said, if we can drive in Pittsburgh, we can drive anywhere. And I know he was bragging about the bad weather <laughs> that they have in Pittsburgh to test with. But when I look at this, I think anywhere, like if you think of the, if you look on the next slide, this is like driving in Ireland you know, <laughs> or on the next slide, you know, driving in India or on the next slide, driving in Tel Aviv. And these are just picking the most extreme versions of things. I can tell you that it's not the same to drive, you know, in Chelsea or Midtown you know, <laughs> or, you know, Queens. So, um, and I think the question of, of how the cars who are, which are autonomous drive is really important. This is a story um, from Wired Magazine and the headline is why people keep rear ending self-driving cars. And the punchline is, is because those cars drive poorly. They drive legally, they follow exactly the rules, but they wait an awfully long time at stop signs. They don't behave like people do. And when you go to the next slide, you can see that the car um, and technology companies basically are kind of in this like unusual situation where there are these rules about how they're supposed to behave. And then there's the way that the people who on the road expect people to behave. And so even though the California crash reports make clear that, you know, these cars are being rear ended at 10 times the rate of, you know, human drivers, you know, the people who make these cars really just don't know how to make the cars behave better. Um, and they don't want to break the law. But I think this has real consequences. When we look at the next slide, there's this um, New York Times article. The headline is wielding rocks and knives, Arizonans attack self-driving cars. And I think a lot of people assume it's something like what Karen was saying about is people raising their, you know, their up in arms because gig workers will lose their jobs or truck drivers won't be able to do things. But, you know, especially I think the people in Cornell Silicon Valley know from being near these cars, people are angry because these cars drive terribly. <laughs> <laughs> they are infuriating. So um, in our research, um, if you go to the next slide, we actually have a setup where we have um, a driving simulator, but unlike the driving simulator, we usually have our participants driving in. And um, we use a, a VR headset and we have two drivers driving the same virtual world. And we're looking at how those drivers interact with each other in different situations like coming to four-way stops or merging. And you might think this is something that the car companies would know. like. We all know when we rent a car that we drive differently, differently wherever we go, because you have to spend a bunch of time figuring out what the lingua franca of the road is, but they don't actually have the data about how those differences are really manifest in each place. Um, and so with this system, we can actually um, go to different places and run experiments and see you know, how people are negotiating with one another on the road. So in the next slide, we have a video showing how this system works. So that red car is a fake 
I mean, it's a virtual car, but the other two cars are being driven by the participants in the experiment, and they just negotiate around that block car. And afterwards, when we're an analyzing the situation, we can actually see um, how they're moving. And you can see with those cones, we can also see how they're moving their heads when they're noticing each other or able to notice each other. Um, and also, we are um, we have sensors that we can actually model where people's hands are and if they you know physically gesture. This is a four-way stop, and both cars are, are, you know, given GPS instructions to turn left. Um, and we see how people negotiate that. So on the next slide, I actually have um, a pilot run, video from pilot run, where we ran this experiment in uh, Haifa with our partners at the Technion. What we're looking at on the screen behind the researcher on the left is what the woman on the right with a headset has in her uh, VR view. Um, you actually see when she scratches her ear in a second, um, the, the view tips a little. This woman, she just sees the other driver and even though we can't see that well because of the resolution, she can see that waving because she waves back. And then when they're through the intersection, they actually fill out a survey with their eyes, you know. So this is the kind of work we're doing and we're trying to do it in a few different countries so we can understand how um, the driving norms and cultural signaling might be different. And that, that kind of information is really useful to people who are designing autonomous cars so they can account for the way that driving is really different, different places we go. So would you say that's the biggest obstacle right now to sort of widespread adoption of autonomous vehicles is the lack of data? Yeah, I think, you know, there was a point in time when it seemed like science fiction that a robot car could actually sense all these physical obstacles on the road. And I think that kind of, you know, objection is, is largely taken care of. Um, but, but we're not going to go, just like Karen said, overnight to, a, you know, world where we have manually driven cars, you know, semi-autonomous cars, um, and to a, a world where it's all autonomous cars. And until we have that, and that might never happen, you know, um, we people, these, these autonomous cars are going to have to interact with people. And I think it's a blind spot for the people who develop the autonomous cars. They always tested their, you know, robot cars out in the desert and these, you know, um, city streets where they've cleared all the streets of people. And I think they're surprised to find out how difficult people are, even that people are different in different places, even though we know that to be true in our everyday lives. Um, but really getting a handle on that is, is really important. Wow. Yeah, there seems to be like a very big, uh, I guess it could be like a slippery slope between data collection <clears throat> and privacy also. So kind of going back to Karen's research on truck drivers being monitored, Actually, let me segue back to you, Karen. What, what sorts of other monitoring things do you think are going on in the workforce uh, from your research? What kind of surveillance may be happening that people aren't, aren't really aware of? Because surveillance is actually being marketed now, not just to workers, but like monitor your baby, monitor your home when you're not there. And there was just a big hack, I think, just yesterday that was reported about a, a hacker got into the surveillance network of all kinds of cameras. So anything on that would be interesting from you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Julie, that um, data collection is becoming really quickly ingrained into lots of different arenas of life where we might not have thought of them as being digitally mediated, right? So, you know, there's been data collection in the workplace for a long time, but it's entering different kinds of workplaces than it used to, like trucking or like, um, you know, working from working remotely. Um, and it's entering the home and the family and intimate relationships, too, with really interesting implications. And also, as you point out, right, oftentimes consumers are as much surveillers as they are the surveilled, right? Like we often occupy both of those, both of those roles. Um, in work, you know, it's, it's interesting how we see, you know, not just in trucking, but in other, in other industries, especially low wage labor, um, you know, again, the impact of automation, both in terms of job displacement and in terms of actually really changing what 
the pace of work looks like or what the work expectations are. You know, there's a lot of really interesting research now about what it is to be managed by an AI mediated system, um, what it is to work alongside a robot in a warehouse, how that change kind of makes you more of a robot because you have to adjust your pace to sort of match that of the system. So I think they're all sort of, all of these dynamics are sort of of a piece with what Wendy and Sylvia are, are describing, right? The need to like really take these human consequences, right? And human interactions into account from the outset when we design. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia, Wendy had talked about data as one of the biggest challenges to the broader and safer application of autonomous vehicles. Um, what would you say about that? Or, or what are some of the other key technical challenges? Uh, well, I totally agree with Wendy. And in addition, I think one of the uh, main limitations of existing autonomous vehicles is the ability um, to perceive their environment. Um, in, even though we've had tremendous strides in computer vision and artificial intelligence, I still think that the ability to perceive the environment of, by autonomous vehicles and autonomous algorithms is still very far removed from the, the ability that humans have to do so. Um, for example, um, right now autonomous cars have pretty advanced sensors on board, you know, from LiDAR to cameras that can give them very accurate measurements of depth, um, presence of obstacles, and also other visual features. But they're not really able to anticipate what is about to happen in their surroundings. And that is a crucial aspect of safe driving. So it's also, I believe, the reason that we have uh, autonomous air vehicles, but we do not yet have fully autonomous cars. So when we're driving, you are constantly anticipating what pedestrians and other drivers are about to do. And we do that um, and use those predictions and expectations to make decisions about how we are going to drive and what we're going to do. And these decisions can be life-saving. So as Wendy's work has shown in these multicultural settings, um, the ability to understand and predict other people's behaviors, even how they drive, you know, what to expect, for example, at an intersection in Naples where people may drive for a red light <laughs> compared to New York City, where you know you cannot make a right on left, uh, sorry, a right on red, <laughs> right, um, is very critical to the ability to drive safely when surrounded by humans. Um, so I think autonomous vehicles may be able to predict what other autonomous vehicles are going to do, but currently they're definitely not yet able to predict human actions. Um, so one of the areas that we're working on right now is to develop algorithms that can use explicit visual features such as actions, appearance, and so forth, including context, and also uh, some historical data to anticipate people's actions. And um, we're doing so by also inferring uh, aspects such as social roles, social interactions, and other hidden characteristics of the scene that can potentially be inferred from the visual cues that you can estimate currently with, with computer vision. Uh, so at this time, we're testing these methods on team sports where players are constantly um, having to anticipate what the other players are going to do in order to win the game. Uh, and I think this has great potential also for reducing the possibility about accidents or um, possibly collisions with other vehicles and pedestrians that can be harmful and, of course, uh, extremely dangerous. Wow. So the three of you are not typically in the same physical place, and you're working on such interesting and somewhat overlapping areas. I'm wondering if you have any questions for each other. I have a question for Wendy. <laughs> So Wendy, how is your multicultural work doing <laughs> now that we're in these remote settings? Are you able to get participants to do some of the tests using VR? Because it would seem like a perfect approach for you to be able to perform some of these tests in under this type of conditions. You know, to be honest, we've we've put this on hold, although we're, you know, we're writing grant proposals, analyzing the data from the pilot runs. Um, but I think I think this is a little bit on hold until people are vaccinated and we're able to travel, you know. Um, I think we could actually put different participants in neighboring rooms, but, you know, it's it's very difficult to set this up when you can't be in a room with the participant. Um, but the, I will say some of the research that we've been doing, our goal is to not so much profile individuals, but to look at, at big differences across communities and across neighborhoods. And some of the other work that we're doing 
looking at naturalistic driving in the city um, turns out to be really useful for studying social distancing behavior. Um, so we actually have yeah. uh, got a grant to look at social distancing behavior across New York City um, using data that comes from network dash cams in these Ubers and Lyfts. <laughs> um, just to what Karen's saying about the incredible amount of um, surveillance is going on. And we can actually tell by looking at the people counts in different places and also some of what they're wearing, like like how many people are out, um, maybe what they're out for. And we're trying to do things like mass detection, tell you know where people are doing social distancing, looking at uh, what kinds of things we can do to analyze, which people just happen to be passing each other and which people are actually together in group. Um, so the, it's been this thing that I think you know, well, we have a lot of data that we'll probably be analyzing for a decade, but um, right now we're focused on that. And then we're excited to get back to the days when we can just focus on why people don't run into each other on the street. I'm really looking forward to seeing your results. Thanks. Can I actually, can I pick up on something that, that you brought up, Wendy, in your talk also about um, the idea that, you know, we all know that the law kind of means go roughly 55 miles an hour, no more, mm -hmm. but that, you know, that Waymo may design or other, other uh, developers may design their, their systems to follow those rules much more closely, right? Or to stop longer at a stop, a stop sign or something. Um, that I find like to be such an interesting phenomenon, like coming from the law, like, <laughs> folks, I mean, it's really interesting, right? Because there is this kind of like wink and a nod that we do where we're like, well, that's the law, but like not really, right? And sometimes <laughs> even following the law too closely, Right. And lead to these really negative social impacts, right? It reminds me a little bit of um, like in labor, like a work to rule action where, you know, as a form of labor protest, workers will follow all the rules in the rule book, like to the letter, which is like a form of slowdown, like a work slowdown. Because if you really do everything you're supposed to do, then like social life sort of grinds to a halt, right? And you can weaponize that. So I'm super interested in kind of how those teams are balancing between like obviously then you know it doesn't look great to program your your card to violate the law right and i'm sure there's liability concerns there but they also have to function right so yeah i mean i i don't know that um i i, I think there's two things going on i think that the companies feel like well we're, we're doing what's legal so we can't be at fault you know yeah. um, so, so that's a little bit the facile response but that's the response but the other thing is adapting to social behavior is hard you know and they don't even have the data that would enable them to do it. And they don't have research programs that like let them start. And so I think that that's actually one of the things that's going on, but not being talked about. And um, we actually have talked to, um, like we, we submitted a grant with GM and they are looking at data that they could collect at intersections. And they're, they're trying to understand like how is, how are intersection uh, behaviors different in different places. Um, so it, it is definitely an interesting research problem, but it's not one that's going to be solved soon. I'm sure no self-driving car company wants to hang their funding on them solving this problem. <laughs> um, but realistically, you know, when, I, mean, I, I think it's not different from the development of, of um, natural language technologies when, you know, many of us have things that seem to talk just like people now in our homes. So it, but they, they thought when they started those kinds of projects, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, like it might take 10 years a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and really what we learned is just how sophisticated human speech is, not just what is said and understood, but also what is not said. <laughs> um, and I think it's similar. Social interaction is actually incredibly complex. Um, I guess if you want to, you could look at it as a series of corner cases. Um, but those, you know, those corner cases are what social intelligence are all about, and people are really good, as Sylvia is saying, is like of reading what's going on and anticipating what's next seeing you know the behavior car knowing that car can't be trusted and you should stay far from it like that's something this going to be a really long time before machines have that kind of intelligence i wonder if each of you could share a prediction that you have not seen written about sort of in the press not that i'm looking for article ideas or anything but <laughs> I don't know if it's a prediction. I would really like um, for the people who have control of some of these technologies that like Karen is talking about to empower individual workers. And I think that's something I'm interested in, like what people are doing to kind of take these technologies and make it their own and, and serve their own ends. That's something, you know, as the technologies become cheaper and easier to use, I, I really want to see that. 
Yeah, I would say also kind of like more of a, a wish list than a prediction. Like I would similarly like to see kind of technical development go hand. Like sometimes we use technology as sort of a band-aid over some social or economic problem rather than addressing the root cause of the problem. Like that's often kind of the approach that that we tend to take. And I would really love to see greater integration between addressing like labor problems or addressing the problems of communities that are negatively implicated or impl excuse me, implicated by new technologies, like making sure that there are ways that one can use technology um, to address those communities' needs. And oftentimes that requires some partnership between like an economic policy or a social policy and tech development. So I'd like to see that kind of aisle crossing a little bit more. I guess my prediction is after this pandemic, I think people are going to value even more the role of human beings. <laughs> And so the the work on looking at technology and automation in the context of humans and humans' behaviors and interactions and, and jobs is going to be much more important than full full autonomy or full blown out autonomy. I think I think we've all grown to appreciate social interactions. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but I think that we're much less keen on you know, using systems that are fully automated and, and actually interacting with other human beings and kind of go back to some of the um, root, you know, behaviors that we used to have and not have everything be in the form of some virtual interface. I really miss meeting people in person, you know, and just like Wendy said, when you uh, when you're around people, you can pick up on cues from their behavior. You can smooth problems over much more easily. You know, a friend of mine said, since their kids have gone to fully remote settings, that has that uh, they have formed such tensions with the teachers because there is no conflict resolution, and every small misunderstanding and conflict conflict grows to like an ex exponential degree where now the teachers don't trust the kids and the kids are angry at the teachers and there's never any convergence or or appeasement of the of the situation because of the lack of human contact so i hope that this is again maybe not so much a prediction or a hope but a hope but i do think that from what everything i can see um being in a fully autonomous uh, setting is not going to be something people will be looking forward to. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, we're the users of these technologies. Let's face it, you know, we're going to be in the car. <laughs> the car is not going to go by itself to pick up our kids. <laughs> so. So true. Um, gosh, wow, the time flew by. Thank you so much for sharing your research and your insights and all your thoughts and creative everythings. Um, I wish we had more time, but I really appreciate you spending your evening with us. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks so much, nice Julie. To see you, Karen and Wendy. You yeah. too. <laughs>